This conference will now be recorded. Who is joining us from the Northeast today? Connecticut. I'm sorry, who was that? Mitch from Connecticut. Oh, hi Mitch, how are you doing? Living the dream. <laughs> All right, who else is joining us from the Northeast? All right, anybody joining us from the Midwest? Wisconsin. Hello. Penny Williams from Missouri. Hi, Penny. Hi. Anyone else from the Midwest? Lori Rickert from Ohio. Lori and Rachel, I see you joining us too. And Indiana is on here as well. This is Tracy. You got some other people on as well from Indiana. Great, thank you. Anybody joining from the South? Anybody joining from the Southwest area? Hey, it's Jimmy Borders from Arizona ADAP. Hey, Jimmy. Anybody joining from the West Coast? This is Lisa Davis from Alaska. Martha Graham from Washington State. Oh, hey, Martha. Hey. And Erin, I got your message from Tennessee. Is there anyone I'm forgetting or uh, that I haven't yet announced that is joining us? Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Um, okay, so who from NASDAQ is joining us? Uh, this, this is, is Amy from NASDAQ. Virgil Hayes from NASDAQ. Hi, this is Lori from NASDAQ. Hey, everyone. Um, oh, gotcha, Jessica. Thank you. And if you weren't able to share or um, you know missed an opportunity, just go ahead and um, write down your your jurisdiction in the chat function, and I'll be sure to include it. Um, all right, so why don't we turn turn this over to Amy um, from NASA just to give an overview of some of the things that we want to talk about on the call today. Thanks, Christina. And hi, everyone. This is Amy. Um, so yeah, as, as Christina said, we wanted to set this time um, post the webinar that Dory led um, last week and um, really post some time in, in sort of this, this new normal um, to, to have a more informal conversation about both the challenges that folks are seeing um, out in your jurisdictions um, and any support that NASDAQ can provide. Um, so in, in terms of, of agenda, we don't, we don't have any formal presentation for today. Um, really, we, we want to um, uh, have this be as discussion-based as possible. Um, so we will sort of facilitate um, you know, a series of topics. And um, I think the, uh, the first thing that we wanted to cover is um, to sort of allow a smaller um, debrief from the webinar that um, that Dory led. And so I'm gonna turn it to Dory um, just to kind of walk through the major topics that we covered. We know it was um, a lot of, of information um, and to really provide an opportunity for folks to ask questions, um, if there are any uh, additional sort of topics that we should put on our list um, under the, the umbrella of you know, public and private insurance access during this time. Um, this is this is the time we'd like to hear that. Um, so let me turn it now to Dory just to kind of walk us through the 
um, uh, you know, overarching topics we covered on the webinar, and then we'll we'll open it up for um, discussion and questions. So, Dory, I'm going to hand it to you. Thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, some of you might have attended my webinar last week. Um, so uh, th thanks for joining us. Uh, so I'll just talk for a minute or so about you know, what we covered there. Um, <clears throat> so depending on um, your jurisdiction and the type of coverage that a client has, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, or private insurance, there are a number of federal, state, and issuer level policies that can help clients access COVID-19 testing and treatment. Uh, there are also policies in place right now that help clients access non-COVID-19 care safely while complying with social distancing. For example, telehealth, early medication refills, 90-day supply, uh, supplies of medications. <clears throat> uh, Medicare policy is at the federal level. Um, and for clients with Medicaid and private insurance, we encourage everyone to regularly check with your state Medicaid agency, your state insurance department, or even with your client's insurance company, because some insurers have implemented policies um, at the insurer level, to uh, learn about protections and flexibilities that are available to clients during this time. Uh, and of course, NASAD is here to help troubleshoot questions related to health coverage and to provide guidance to uh, Part B and ADAP programs on best practices to ensure an uninterrupted access to care uh, during this time. Um, slides and a recording of that webinar um, are expected to be circulated today. Um, and I will uh, stay on also to answer questions about these topics during the Q&A. Thanks. So thanks, Dory. I think I think that's a good place to start for folks. Um, you know, w why don't we we kind of have a, we'll start with like an overarching question of, you know, in, in terms of Medicaid access, private insurance access issues, um, any challenges that folks are seeing, anticipating seeing, um, and any follow-up, um, you know, from the webinar, but really under the sort of broad topic of um, public and private insurance access. Let's just open it up to the group to see if folks can, um, you know, provide an update as to what you're seeing, um, challenges that maybe we either covered or didn't cover on the webinar, um, uh, any, any updates that folks wanna add and or questions. Amy, I'll kick it off. This is Jimmy in Arizona. I know for us, um, for some weird reason, it's almost like we're still waiting for the ball to drop. Uh, we haven't seen this mass exodus of folks off of their insurance, their employer insurance, over to Medicaid or etc. cetera. Um, we keep anticipating these folks to lose their insurance and we're just not getting word of that. Um, with us, we kept paying the FFM premiums, uh, even for folks that may have been temporarily laid off, we did not make them go to Medicaid. Uh, we just didn't want to deal with the disruption that would cause, and then um, so we left we left them alone. And then the only the only really issue we had was ironing out the confusion with folks what documents were required, uh, you know, during a during a uh, re-enrollment because some folks thought that we were waiving all requirements to send in support documents and just basically, you know, rubber stamping COVID-19 on it which was not the case because we have ways for them to submit documents like text, texting and pictures of the documents, uh, scan and email, things like that. Thanks, Jimmy. And I guess to, to kind of put a finer point on it, I mean, that's that's actually, that's, that's helpful to hear um, in terms of like where we are on impact or other jurisdictions. Are you seeing um, a lot of churn as people lose or are you seeing a lot of people lose um, access to employer-sponsored insurance right now, or are you sort of in a similar place as Arizona in terms of, uh, you know, sort of anticipating changes but not yet seeing them? In Wisconsin, this is Amy. Um, we are in the same boat as Jimmy. We haven't seen a whole lot of changes yet. We've heard um, some employers are, you know, thinking of cutting back hours or discontinuing insurance, but we haven't seen anything. So no impact yet here. Okay. Okay. You know, then I, 
I think then I'll sort of move us to and and Tim, you know, feel free to jump in to to add any nuance to this part of the conversation. But um, I it it is this is one of those um I think unique uh unique sort of circumstances of you know sort of as, as Jimmy sort of aptly put it like waiting waiting for the the shoe to drop um. And so, you know, how are folks forecasting potential impact? Or are you like, are 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 any um, would anyone be willing to share sort of what their Part B um, and ADAP, uh, uh, what what you all are are currently doing in terms of um, anticipating uh, a surge in in unemployment? Um, you know, anticipating uh, uh, adding folks to the ADAP uh, full pay roles. Um, uh, has has anyone started to put like pen to paper on um, those types of projections and what what does that look like? Yeah, um, hi everyone, this is Tim. I just wanted to piggyback on Amy's question and uh, yeah, I think yeah, we're we're very interested to hear <clears throat> what sort of forecasting work that has been done, you know, around you know not only cost containment, you know, but um, but importantly, um, any potential you know losses or shifts um, in you know uh, rebate revenue. Uh, that would be coming in as a result of uh, you know potential large number of um, you know, folks moving out of uh, the employer-sponsored insurance you know, sort of bucket and uh, either into Medicaid or onto you know an ACA plan that's actually going to be associated with higher premium costs uh, for the ADAP um, or uh, you know onto onto full pay rosters. So yeah, I mean we're, we're very um, interested to hear about uh, sort of any sort of uh, forecasting work that's been done um, by you guys. Hi, this is Mitch in Connecticut. Um, so I've actually been working with our PBM to run the numbers. And um, typically we have about 300 new clients enroll into ADAP for the first time per year. So we've been trying to track and see if there's been an uptick in that or a decrease as more people are going into Medicaid because of this. And we've actually seen a decrease in new people enrolling in ADAP to date. For the first four months of the year, we've only had uh, about 55 new people enrolled into ADAP. So we are seeing a, a decrease in um, people enrolling into ADAP because more people are enrolling into Medicaid. And that also coincides with not as many people utilizing our premium assistance program. Um, we've only had seven people apply for premium assistance of those 55 that are newly enrolled. Thank you, Mitchell. That's helpful. Hey, Tim, it's Jimmy. And for us, um, the only folks that we've actually asked to go to Medicaid were folks that permanently lost their job. So they were fired or the business closed and won't be reopening. So those folks we did transition or we've asked them to transition to Medicaid. As far as cuts because of the impact on the Gilead uh, rebates to us, we are now in the middle of switching our entire model over from a rebate model to a program income model. Um, we're looking to get that up and running here in the next three months, uh, simply because the volume of cuts because of that was just too overwhelming. So we're gonna switch over to a program income model because we think we can make most um, most of what we lost back. So that's one thing that's happening. Obviously, COVID was part of the discussion of why we did it. Um, but if I had to put a percentage on both, I'd say it was probably 80% Gilead rebate cuts and 20% COVID impact thus far. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I have a question for you. Follow-up question on that. Um, you, you talked about you know, those who were going to be permanently unemployed and moving them into Medicaid. How are you making that determination, um, uh, particularly in, in the con in the context of COVID? Uh, I think it, I mean, are the, is it very clear cut in terms of who's actually just been furloughed and will likely be returned to work um, versus those who are you know permanently unemployed? Is that fairly clear to you uh, right from the start? No, it, it's contingent on if they've lost their job permanently. So if they sit down with their case management or our central eligibility and they basically say, I've been fired, I don't have a job to go back to, then we're moving them to Medicaid. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? What, what is, what, what's everyone else doing? 
What's everybody else anticipating? Hello, this is Rachel from Minnesota. Um, right now, what we're seeing is is um, some difficulty between some what some of the state programs are doing based on the additional unemployment income from the CARES Act and how that will be counted against programs for referral. Um, we understand it's not counted towards Medicaid, but it is um, applied to um, our state basic health plan that we have called Minnesota Care that ensures people up to 200% with a sliding scale um, cap on, on premiums and has really low co-pays. Um, those two combined incomes with unemployment and then the additional CARES Act puts them above that 200% normally and then would put them in the in the realm of having to to choose a, a QHP plan for them. So it's just trying to figure out where people are and get the documentation together so that we can get them into the right programs if they are losing their health care. That's helpful, Rachel. And this is this is Amy. Um, you know, I, I would add to that, and I know Dory covered this um, on the webinar and and thank you to, to everybody who responded to the informal RFI. Um, you know, we we also wanted to get a sense of um, really what what ADAPs were doing in terms of um, counting, um, particularly the, you know the stimulus was, was a little bit more straightforward um, in terms of not counting that as income, but um, in terms of the unemployment insurance boost. Um, and and we did find that you know the the vast majority of of programs were were uh, following Medicaid and not counting the UI boost. Um, but that's that's actually good to hear. We were, uh, I mean, not good to hear. It's it's a challenge. But um, we were trying to get a sense of, you know, what impact that would have in in terms of programs. And I think we were more focused on sort of ADAP eligibility and not as much on how it would um, impact eligibility for other programs in the state, like the Basic Health Plan. So that um, that is helpful. Um, and you know, I guess like staying on this kind of vein, just because we did have a lot of response. Does anyone else have any other? Um, questions or comments to add about the impact of um, stimulus money and or the the UI boost? Uh, this is Rachel again. I'm sorry. I, we just had some confusion over, do we count? How many weeks do we count? Do we count the weeks that, the, the weeks that are there or do you count the weeks plus the, um, the possible um, addition? That's where we got it a little bit tricky because we, one way it would definitely not be above our program income regardless of what was counted and the other way it could possibly be. So we just wanted to know if other states had any ideas about that. Are you referencing counting the unemployment? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, how many, I mean, because when you're projecting out for a year, there's a there's a limit on that benefit, but there's also the possibility of an extension. Are states counting the extension as well? I know for us, we count however long the client's getting the payment. Because if you look on their statement, a lot of them have a total amount payout. Like they may be eligible for $8,000 worth of income, but they're only getting 240 is the limit in Arizona, but they're only getting 240 a week. So we, we only counting the 240, the extra 600 we do not count. And that's the same thing our Medicaid's doing. The only problem we have is our Medicaid annualizes that 240, which it's not right. It's it's totally wrong. We fought it and fought it and fought it at nausea, and they just don't listen because it's just the way they are. So that's that's we we don't do their annualization. We just count to 240 uh, up to their max payout. Okay. And Amy, I got a kind of an odd question that came up in our work group. Um, how are folks? What well, maybe NASDAQ can help. Is there any thought process to if folks decide to stay home and when they when things go back to normal and how that will impact? Because we can't seem to get a clear cut answer on whether unemployment will still be paid or not. Oh, I see. So if unemployment is being paid now, but then people have the option of 
going back to work once things open up, like their job is, is sort of still waiting for them? What happens to the unemployment? Well, what happens if they have they don't have a quote unquote option and they they're told to go back to work and they yeah. choose to err on the side of safety and say no I'm like because we're getting questions from a lot of you know frontline workers that now that restaurants are slowly starting to open they're like i don't know if i want to walk back into this so when we can't get an answer out of our unemployment department that they're going to continue to pay them so it's this weird <laughs> you know it's like a push and shove match without pushing and shoving <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I mean, I, I will say what I have heard on that. I think it's going to be a flashpoint. I mean, I think there are some states who have sort of unequivocally said, like, no, you can't collect unemployment. I do think we'll probably start to see litigation um, on that, particularly if, if there is some sort of underlying condition that, um, you know, is is uh, makes someone uh -huh. um, uh, uh, sort of more at risk for COVID-19. Um, but I, I, I have not, I have not seen any specifics on that as of yet. I think it's a really good question, um, and it is probably, um, you know, an, an advocacy point at at the federal level to kind of see, like, you know, when where can federal support um, sort of continue to to kick in, and then and then at the state level, um, you know, to the extent that those are state policy decisions too. But it's a good question and one that I don't I don't know the definitive answer to, but I have heard rumblings of ADA litigation being brought up. Uh -huh. Because I know the PUA, the six hundred dollar PUA award, that ends yeah. at the end of July, correct? Dory, do you know that? Do you know when the, the end date is? I don't think I know that off the top of my head. Yeah, it's July 31st, um, barring, I don't know if there will be an extension or if there's been talk of an extension, but for right now, um, the boost ends on July 31st. However, the extra 13 weeks, um, that, can, that can continue, but um, any weeks of unemployment after July 31st will be the, your normal unemployment payment. But the, uh, the boost ends on July 31st. Yeah, so after July 31st, it reverts back to the state-specific amount. Yes, barring an exception, an extension at the federal level. Yeah, well, I'm not holding my breath on that one. <laughs> Probably a good idea. This is right, Martha from Washington. Oh, great. Go ahead, Martha. Um, Washington State uh, Employment Security Department has, they've kind of gone back and forth. I, you know, I think that they're doing the same thing as the rest of us trying to figure this all out but i know that um i've heard that they will be following up and requiring um, letters from employers about return to work dates so if your return to work date is set but you don't return to work like jimmy was saying if someone said hey i'm not feeling this um then they're required to start looking for employment so they go back into the normal unemployment um, you know, follow up and looking for work and having to prove that they're looking for work. So my feeling is that if you choose to not go back to work, um, I could see that coming up and, and being um, an issue of, mm -hmm. well, it's not about choice. Or if they're going to just require you to look for something that fits your situation, that could be, you know, completely telework. But I, I just know that they're going to have to follow the normal unemployment process. Well, I know here what's causing the problem here is that scenario. If you choose to not go back, they treat that as you quit, and you're not eligible yeah, for that, unemployment. Yeah, uh, I've heard some rumblings of that too. If an employer yeah, offers. Totally. That's what we're hearing in our swag meetings and our client meetings because we're still we've kind of ramped those up through both Part A and our, our local folks and that's what we're hearing is folks are like I don't know if I want to go back to work you know <laughs> so now you know of course we have the stories where folks are like I'm not trying to go back till I have to because I'm making more money now than I am when I'm working so it is what it is on that one so <laughs> yeah I could see them choosing to. Um treat that as quitting mm -hmm. to save the bottom dollar. That's for sure something NASAD can can look into. I, I do think, you know, I do think that's going to be important state state policy issue. Um, and, you know, well, I, I will 
kind of open it up again, just in terms of because um, I we we have gotten a lot of questions on this this um, unemployment uh, unemployment insurance issue. Anything else on that? Any other comments or questions on that specific issue? Um, I have a suggestion actually for how to maybe maybe learn the answer to that question. This is Dory. Um, I was thinking about the fact that every state has some like legal aid that help people with might help people with unemployment related um, issues, and that agency in your state might know the answer to this question. It's just like an idea. And we will also try to figure it out. That's helpful, Dory. So I'm going to move us to a um, similar. I mean, we've got like two two more topics that I want to cover. Um, and and one, you know, and and this could be a too early to tell, but I as as you know, we fielded an RFI. Um, uh, a week ago, and thank you for for everybody who filled it out. That was um, incredibly helpful. We got um, a very strong response rate. Um, but we did we did in that in that RFI, um, and so this is just an opportunity to kind of talk about it. Ask uh, if states were anticipating cost containment strategies, um, if they were actively exploring those. Um, uh, and so we we want to to sort of add that to the agenda and just you know ask is that is that something you know given anticipated fluctuations in in cuts in you know state budgets um, cuts in uh, drops in rebate revenue um, sort of all of the the above economic fallout um, from COVID nineteen um, are your jurisdictions currently exploring any cost containment um, strategies. Amy, I know for us, like I said, back to when the loss of rebates has uh, done what it's done, uh, Ricardo's had to cut the budgets of all of our contractors, and I mean all of them, Ramsell, everybody, all of our Part B contractors. So he's adjusted budgets accordingly. Um, nothing substantial was, was hit by the clients, uh, service deliveries to the clients. Some limits were brought back down. Uh, we used to have a $5,000 per person limit on dental. We brought that back to 1500 which is still phenomenal. For I mean, it's it's a little below the average that we were paying out anyway, even with the set of 5000 So, And then anyone needing above that can request, you know, an exception. Um, but other than the, the little cut to dental, we haven't had to do too much uh, damage, if you will, to many of the other programs. Uh, luckily, with housing, with the federal money and a lot of the other money that was coming, a lot of our housing programs were able to step up using that money to help our clients that were impacted. Thank you, Jimmy. This is Martha in Washington. I think that um, right now we've kind of just been in a holding pattern because like Jimmy said, we haven't seen a huge increase or decrease or, or shift or churn. Um, and so we're trying to see if there's going to be a tide or um, a trend. Uh, so right now it's kind of hard to predict or kind of hard to plan. Um, mm -hmm. I know that for uh, in our state um, health exchange, um, if clients go in and enter their income, um, obviously, uh, well, our system, it, it automatically looks to see if they're expanded Medicaid eligible. So we've kind of told people to hold off changing their income status inside of the health plan finder because that could shift them into Medicaid. But if they're going to go to, back to work in a few weeks, I mean, mm -hmm. and that's what we're kind of waiting for the governor to see, you know, how the phase implementation of, you know, coming back to work was going to uh, play out. But we are starting to think about how that could affect the um, with the premium tax credits, you know, if you're saying that you make this much money uh, and if we start, you know, if we overpay and at the end of the year, 
uh, we just have to really vigorously pursue getting back that money on folks' taxes. Um, mm -hmm. So those, those are kind of, you know, because if, the, if their income is incorrectly reported, basically, for right now, yeah. um, we're worried about that. Um, but again, I think we're still just waiting to see what's going to happen and we're not seeing too much right now. Uh, I'm confirming with our uh, state Medicaid about transitioning because we're concerned that uh, you can transition in from a qualified health plan to Medicaid. Are you able to see a doctor right now um, mm -hmm. to initiate that, that new insurance and to continue with antiretrovirals? Um, so that's why we kind of instructed folks just to hold tight. But now that, you know, things are, it, it's not just a few weeks of staying at home or, you know, month-ish. Um, gosh, and I lost track of time, so I don't, I can't quantify that anymore. Um, so it's kind of just a, a wait and see. We didn't want folks to um, shift one way too much and overwhelm the system or not be able to get care then we would have to safety net. The, so, you know, um, we're still just waiting and waiting and see. And that's, that's helpful, Martha. And I think, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that probably sums up where a lot of people are, but it, one, one question, just so I'm clear in, in sort of how are you, this sort of holding pattern that you're in. So you're talking about, uh, like a swath of clients who are temporarily unemployed and have lost their, employment sponsored insurance is that like the group that are sort of like in this purgatory between medicaid uh eligibility and adap supported qualified health plans uh no it's mostly the folks that are in qualified health plans that didn't have employer sponsored insurance um got you okay we're seeing less you know i thought that there'd be more requests for either co you know so and that was a thing too um we are willing to pay a cobra even though that's a qualifying event that could take them into a qualified health plan. We're mm -hmm. wanting, you know, that's still a shift in insurance. And so again, that goes right back into, are you able to see a new doctor? Does your doctor mm -hmm. um, take the insurance that we would shift you to? And so it brings up just so many questions, but we're not seeing as many employer sponsored folks losing their insurance as of now. And I don't okay. know if that's the generosity of Washington employers that are paying those premiums right now um on a wait and see we thought we would had have had more folks come to us with a, you know like you know oh well i've lost my employer sponsor for now what do i do but again mm -hmm. that's only been less than a handful so um the majority of our folks that aren't on medicare are on qualified health plans we have uh, about 950 folks on qualified health plans um, and we're not seeing too much of a shift. And again, there's been handfuls of folks that knew, you know, they, they've been told they're not returning to their employment, so they've been permanently um, laid off, you know. Um, and those folks are transitioning into to Medicaid. But again, mm -hmm. handful, handful. Mm -hmm. I hope hey, that answered your question. If not, Amy, I was going to say, Martha and Amy, one thing to keep in mind with the refills, and I don't know if every state's governor did this, but ours had our medical director issue basically a standing order for every type of prescription, not narcotic. So the pharmacy has the ability to literally fill in a refill using Dr. Kara Christ as the signer on the prescription for HIV meds, for blood pressure meds, et cetera. And he included that in one of his executive orders. So when we have clients that can't get to a doctor or we have one doctor here that notoriously holds patients hostage, um, if they don't come to their appointments, he doesn't give them refills. This was the workaround that Governor Ducey put in place at least for one month. And we've had, our pharmacy has had to use that several times. Cause like I said, we have one doctor here that it, it's the most backwards thinking in the world. His office is closed. Yet if he hasn't seen the patient in the last six months, he doesn't want to give a refill. So it's one of those things we'll have to have the board of medicine tackle once we get out of this, but it's, it is what it is for now. But that's mm -hmm. a thought to see if your governors have done that or put something in place similar to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't, uh, that we didn't have that order extended. But we haven't seen too much of a problem of 
uh, refills. A lot of folks are doing it by email. Uh, providers are being very cooperative and just, you know, adding the refill. Um, so, and also we cover telehealth. Um, and so folks are still able to get on their phone, get with, you know, have a doctor appointment um, and we're able to pay for that. So I think that's possibly why there hasn't been too much of an interruption. And I can say that on our, for right now, we're, uh, I also uh, manage our prep debt program and we contracted with a lab. We have a, a, a contract with several hundreds of providers and labs throughout Washington state. Um, and these folks offer at home testing for uh, HIV. Um, and actually there's some other, you know, uh, STD, uh, STI things that go along with that. But for now, we're just piloting it for uh, the at-home test um, to continue our folks on uh, PrEP medication. But we will be looking at that possibly for our future um, on the ADAP side. So. That, that is really, that's actually a nice segue, but because um, I do want to talk about um, sort of CARES Act and, and how, uh, how, how programs are um, using that funding to um, transform how services are being delivered. But let me, let me just pause and, and see, Tim, um, anything else to add uh, in terms of this, the forecasting discussion? Um. No, not yet. Um, um, but I just want everybody to stay tuned. Uh, uh, NASDAQ is about to release a uh, data um, form of its rebate and program income forecasting tool. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for a memo uh, from me in the next couple of days. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Um, all right. Well, let's let's move on to um, sort of our, our last topic. Um, and let me just apologize for the belligerent toddler in the background. Hey, Amy, um, can I ask Amy, yep. can I ask Tim one quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Tim, have we have you seen any impact with remdesivir being pulled for FDA uh, for the testing? Have we seen any impact of that anywhere the in the country? What? what was that? Right, so the impact on what? Uh, for that, do you know how the FDA pulled remdesivir for the this test project they're doing? Have we seen any uh, impact across the uh, country on with that medication being pulled? Uh, no, no, um, uh, okay. no. Uh, so Remdesivir right now is a uh, it's uh, it's an emergency use authorization. Um, Gilead Sciences is uh, you know gearing up to file a new drug application, um, which will bring it to commercialization. So we have not seen anything there. Um, which is obviously just one thing. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that up um, is that this, this will be uh, a, it's a, it's a, an inpatient uh, based product. So. Uh, that should not have uh, any impact um, on uh, ADAP or uh, you know, Ryan White um, core medical and support services. Okay, thanks. So thanks for that, Jimmy and Tim. Um, so you know, the, the last topic we we wanted to spend a few minutes on, um, uh, or the the Part B um, allocations out of the CARES Act. Um, and I know you know HRSA has has now done a few grantee calls on this. Um, they have uh, been fervently updating their COVID um, FAQ page. Um, and so you know we just wanted to to I'll preface this with two things. Um, number one, NASDAQ also received um, CARES Act funding to uh, supplement our ADAP TA uh, cooperative agreement to really do um, specific uh, COVID-19 related uh, technical assistance with, with Part B ADAPs. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to put that on folks' radar. We are, um, uh, we are, are sort of scoping out what that looks like um, and we are really um, open to any and all suggestions of, of where we should put our focus, where the sort of top line um, uh, uh, sort of priority COVID-19 related technical assistance needs are cropping up for you guys. Um, and, you know, the, the I'll, I'll preface this, what we want to hear from you about today um, is, you know, is the, what are you doing with your, your CARES Act funding? I think we've, in the RFI, um, you know, had quite a bit of variability in terms of, you know, investment into ADAP, investment into um, sort of emergency support and, and sort of food services. Um, 
it, it, it sort of ran the gamut. And so we do want to just kind of do a temperature check of, you know, how are folks investing that? Um, is is that that funding enough to meet um, the 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 um, needs coming out of COVID-19, particularly with regard to service delivery. Um, and, you know, are there are there anything the anything NASDAQ can do to support folks who are um, kind of dealing with transforming programs um, uh, in light of COVID-19? So we'll start with the top one, like how are folks using the, the CARES Act money? Do, do folks feel like that has been enough to make a dent in um, uh, in making changes to programs? Um, hi, this is Mitch in Connecticut. Um, honestly, no. Like Connecticut Part B only got two hundred thousand um, dollars, and uh, granted, we do have two Part A's in Connecticut. We have an EMA and the TGA, but apparently there is an issue with uh, the EMA and the way HRSA calculated their formula. Um, it underrepresented almost a thousand clients, so they got less than half of what we received, which is a major bummer. So we had to end up appropriating way more funds into the EMA because it borders New York. And obviously that's a hot spot right now. Um, so it has been a struggle. We haven't been able to really appropriate much towards ADAP or other parts of the state because of that. Um, I guess that's really one-off kind of situation. But of course, it would happen to us. Thanks for that update, Mitchell. And that's interesting. That is the first that I've heard sort of going the other way. Like I've I've heard from other jurisdictions that um, it the it was problematic that the the, the ADAP got um, or Part B got far less than um, the EMA, uh, and that um, and we were trying to figure out why that could be. I think. Um, one theory is that uh, the 2018 RSR data does not uh, incorporate um, clients who are served with rebate funding. Um, so that's helpful to have that perspective. And I guess like I'll sort of open it up like in terms of this amount um, issue, did anyone anyone else have um, uh, any sort of problems in terms of amount comparisons to part A's or, or you know either what what Mitchell kind of raised or or other issues? Amy, I know for us in Arizona, I, I mean, we didn't, you know, obviously what they sent is never enough, you know, in the grand scheme, you know, and then our Part B money was allocated to housing, emergency, uh, housing, food, and emergency uh, utility assistance. I know mm -hmm. our county got a ton of money, the non HIV grant part of it, they got like $400 million for Maricopa County, but they mm -hmm. allocated it to hiring staff and uh, PPE and things like that so you know theirs went more much more broad than the hiv world you know they they went they went in a different route with the 400 million they got okay Anyone else want to share any um, uh, feedback updates about how they are using CARES funding, and/or like what you know if there is more funding needed, if that's meeting needs, like and any any and all kind of feedback on um, what you're using for, how that's going, if that's going to meet anticipated needs. I can speak for Connecticut again. Um, when our governor declared the emergency order back in beginning of March, we had to activate our, you know, natural disaster emergency protocol or whatever, which suspended a lot of our refill limitation policies. So we actually did see an increase in expenditures because of that to the tune of almost $400,000. We anticipate to make up for it later on because, you know, people are going to stockpile medication and then refill it once they run out. So later on, months should be a little less expensive than normal, but you know, $400,000 expenditure, especially at the end of the grant year too, was 
really not great timing. And the fact that we only got 200,000 for the whole state and the ADAP was also not great. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we had a little more, that'd be a lot nicer. Okay, that's good to know. Well, I want to be mindful of folks' time. Um, we may be we may be ending the the um, or nearing the end. Um, I think the the last thing that I just want to give folks a, a minute or two um, to provide feedback on, um, it, it, and you can think on this too. But is there is there anything that NASDAQ can do um, in terms of our technical assistance um, to better support you know Part Bs and ADAPs um, in light of of COVID nineteen? Um, and this is really, you know, we'll be, I think there, there's no program um, that is not impacted by COVID-19. So there's a way in which, um, you know, the entirety of, of NASDAQ's technical assistance and capacity building assistance um, across all of our programs um, will now be responding to um, COVID-19 and, and the needs of, of health departments. But, you know, because we do have specific uh, funding now to, to focus on COVID-19 TA for ADAPS, we do want to hear from you um, about what, what needs are, are rising to the top. The RFI was one way that we, we got that information, but we wanted to open it up to on today's call just to see, um, is there anything um, anything that, that you want to put on our radar um, where we can better support you all? I mean, I know for us, the only thing I can ask is that we not, when when the end date, which I don't think we'll ever have a true known end date, but when when the end date that we're forced to live with comes, that we keep our efforts and our, our attention focused on continuing to look further down the road past that, because I don't think when that end date comes that the impacts will stop. You know, mm -hmm. I think folks, this will continue further out for months, maybe years. You know, to get us back to normal, I kind of in a, in a meeting here with our, some of our governor's folks, I kind of equated it to how uh, the city of New Orleans, how it took them years to actually recover from Katrina, and it, depending on where you go, they've never really truly recovered. And then to not lose focus, that that's going to kind of be the impact as a nation that this pandemic had on on a lot of folks, you know, especially the HIV folks. Thank you, Jimmy. That is helpful. That is good to know. Um, I just had a, a follow-up question. I just wanted to see what other states were doing to track eligibility directly related to COVID. Like, so for our insurance premium assistance, we can only really assume that it's a COVID-related event if it's a COBRA policy, but we don't really know for sure. So anyone's come up with a clever way to determine if enrollment is related to COVID, it'd be nice to hear. Hearing no no willing volunteers on the call, Mitchell, we will at NASDAQ um, try to, to capture that. That's a good question, and that's something that we can try to um, uh, try to collect information on and share that out. Um, uh, that's that we can put that on our list. Thank you. All right. Anything else? that anyone wants to add. And, and let me say too, you know, no wrong door. We know that this is a dynamic um, situation. Um, and so, you know, please, please uh, keep keep us posted. Um, we, we love to hear from you, but um, it is particularly helpful during this time as we are um, in uh, far more constant communication with uh, HRSA HAB, DSHAP folks, um, communication on uh, uh, all things stimulus bills on the Hill. Um, so the more communication about what you are seeing on the ground, needs that are emerging 
questions that are emerging, um, please feel free to reach out to any one of us um, on the, the healthcare access team. We are we are ready, willing, and able um, uh, uh, to talk through things with you all. Um, so let me pause um, and first I'll ask um, the any any NASDAD folks have anything else to add? All right, hearing none. Any final questions, comments, thoughts, um, suggestions for uh, focus areas from um, from uh, health department staff? Okay. Hearing none, um, I'm going to give you all a couple of minutes back of your day, but um, thank you for uh, for tuning on to this uh, informal conversation. This is helpful and um, please keep us posted, but uh, I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Amy.